Are we all set? Okay, Mr. Chairman, we are just checking the broadcast to make sure we are recording. We are now recording and we're about to go simulcast on YouTube in just a moment. Okay, Mr. Chairman, you can start at any time now. Okay, thank you. And good morning and welcome to another virtual Metro Plan Orlando CAC meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. I'm Jeffrey Campbell, pinch hitting today for our chairwoman, Sarah Vaudry. I'll, I'll be chairing the meeting today. And we also have a team of folks working to ensure this meeting runs smoothly. Today's meeting was advertised on Metro Plan Orlando's website and social media, as well as through targeted emails. Florida Sunshine Law typically requires a quorum to be physically present in a room for a government meeting. However, Governor DeSantis suspended this requirement in an executive order allowing government boards to conduct business using virtual meetings. This order has now been extended through July 30th. At this time, I'd like to ask committee member Venice White to do our Pledge of Allegiance. Denise, are you there? Yes, can you hear me well? We can. All right, hands on hearts. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Next, we have a short video to review our virtual meeting guidelines. These guidelines will help our meeting flow smoothly. Welcome to Metro Plan Orlando's virtual meeting. Here are some things you should know. Board and committee members are active participants and members of the public are observers. Our chairperson will make sure to keep the meeting flowing. Please keep your microphone or phone line muted unless recognized to speak. Make sure to pay attention to your video controls as well. Participants are welcome to use the raise hand feature to ask questions after presentations. This feature can be found when clicking on the participants icon. When recognized by the chair to speak, you can unmute yourself. Please make sure to speak clearly so everyone can hear you. You may also submit questions via the chat box by clicking on the chat icon. A moderator will relay your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll keep microphones muted unless you've been recognized to speak. And we'll use the raise hand feature to participate in discussion. There are two public comment points in the meeting. Members of the public who want to speak will use the raise hand feature found in the participants tab. If attending by phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you've called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff and we'll ask you to state your name and contact information for the record. We also accepted comments by email and phone message before the meeting. These guidelines for public comments are posted at metroplanorlando.org slash virtual meetings. Public comments received before the meeting will be read by staff at the conclusion of the meeting. We want this and all future online meetings to be accessible to all participants. Participants may join by computer, tablet, or phone. If you need accommodation to participate in the future, please contact Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, just to start, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, for all the fathers, I hope you've had a wonderful Father's Day. Also, I hope everyone is well and safe and all that's come and gone and trying to come again with regard to this COVID-19, I hope everyone is faring well. I also like to just ask everyone to continue being considerate of others with all that's going on with regard to the civil unrest that we're having in the country. And lastly, I know some are somewhat not content with the way that we've been meeting virtually, but I ask that you're patient with that as well. So that's all I have as far as initial comments. At this time, I'd like to recognize Ms. Marianne Horn of Metro Plan 
Orlando staff for our agenda agenda review. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning to all our committee members and all those attending online. I want to thank you all for being here. I particularly want to thank the Vice Chairman, uh, Jeffrey Campbell, for stepping in today when our chairwoman, Ms. Sarah El Badre, had a sudden conflict come up. Uh, he was very gracious and is doing a great job so far, of course. Um, thank you all for working with us as we conduct these virtual meetings. We appreciate your patience and understanding, as the Vice Chairman said. As many of you are aware, the Governor's Executive Order, which has allowed us to have these committee and board meetings virtually, was set to expire at the end of this month, and this morning we learned that it has been extended through July 30th. Um, even with this extension, we may have our next cycle of committee and board meetings in person. We are looking at the best ways to do that safely, um, observing proper health guidelines for our board and committee members, our staff and the public. Um, if the executive order is extended again, we may continue to meet virtually. So beyond that, I can't really tell you today what our next meeting will look like. Um, there are several options, and this includes looking for venues outside our office so, um, so that we can observe the proper physical distancing. But we will be in touch before our next CAC meeting, which is not until late August. Um, so we will update you and share the procedures for visiting the office in the future. And again, thank you for your flexibility during this time. I would say that we have learned a lot during our virtual meetings. Uh, we discovered some tools and techniques that we will continue to use to help with public outreach. An excellent example, I think, was our annual Transportation Improvement Program, TIP, public meeting, which we had online this week. And you're going to hear more about that from Keith Caskey a little bit later in the agenda. Um, we think offering people the chance to engage in a forum like this conveniently and safely from their homes is a real plus for our process. And if you missed the meeting, um, it is available on our YouTube channel along with all the board and committee meetings that we have and some other resources. They are there now. Um, back to today's meeting, as the Vice Chairman mentioned, we will be using the raised hands feature to recognize committee members and uh, during this meeting and call on members of the public during the comment time. If you have joined us on the phone only without video, please use star six to mute your microphone and unmute it. And please use star nine to raise your virtual hand so that the meeting host can see you and we, we can tell that you want to be recognized. You'll see that there is a chat feature on your toolbar. This communicates with all panelists in this meeting, um, which includes committee and staff members and presenters. Uh, for our panelists, if you will use this if you are having technical issues or need assistance, um, a full record of our chat comments will be included in the public record of this meeting. For those of you on the attendee side, you will see important links and information that will come out to you on that chat that you may want to take note of. Vice Chairman Campbell, that completes my announcements this morning, and there are no changes to our agenda. Uh, so uh, now we'd like to take attendance, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Kathy Goldfarb of our staff to call the roll, and that way we can conform, uh, confirm whether or not we have a quorum for this online meeting. Excellent. Thank you. I'll ask all committee members to please go ahead and unmute yourselves now for the roll call. And you can go on mute again after your name is called. Please make sure your video is on if possible so we can confirm it's you. You'll find the unmute and video buttons on the bottom left side of your toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Please say here or present when your name is called. Campbell Jeffrey. Present. Campbell Carolyn. Present. Sid Edmund. <clears throat> Council Melissa Present Greg Eisenberg Present Russ Halk Here Douglas Henley Douglas Henley I'm here multitasking but I'm here. Okay. 
TJ Legacy Cole. Danny. Brady Lassard. TJ. Brady Lassard. Hector Lizaswain. Present. Atlee Mercer. Gigi Mormon. Here. Teresa Mott. Present. RJ Mueller. Here. Tom O'Hanlon. Here. Brindley Peters. Present. Jeff Pagram. Present. Marissa Salas. Here. Casmore Shaw. Yeah. Dan Stevens. Here. Adam Valencic. Adam Valencic. Theo Webster. Here. Benice White. Present. Scott Zubarek. Here. Mr. Vice Chair, we have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Goldfowl. And Mr. Three Chairman, before you, before you move forward, um, Ms. Mormon, you are showing up on two devices. If you have logged in on your computer and the phone, you may want to disconnect one of them. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well said. Yes. Sir. We will now hear public comments on today's action items. Do we have anyone who wants to speak on any action item? If so, please use your raise hand function found at the bottom of your screen or by pressing star nine on your phone keypad. When we call your name, the host will unmute your microphone. You will see a button pop up that says the host wants to unmute you. Accept the prompt to activate your microphone. We ask that you provide us your name and address for the record. Please hold your comments to two minutes or less. Are there any comments at this time? Mr. Vice Chair, we do not see any hands raised at the moment on the attendees side. So it does not appear that there are any comments. Do we have any written comments that were submitted prior to the meeting? We did not receive any written comments before the meeting either, Mr. Vice Chair. Today we have four action items. Our first action item is the approval of the minutes from our May 27th meeting, which are in tab one in the agenda packets. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Dan Stevens, second. Yeah, I think that was Mrs. Mott for the approval. So we have, the council. Okay. So we have a first and a second. Um, this is a, any discussion? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Direct. Teresa Mott, that, that was, not Teresa Mott. I'm sorry. I did not make the motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Who was who made the motion? Melissa Council made Council. the motion. Okay. So we had Ms. Council for the for the motion, and we the second was made by Dr. Thank Stevens. You. Okay. So we have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Now, this is a voice vote, so I'll ask all the committee members to unmute yourself at this time. Mm -hmm. All in favor by saying yes? Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. Are there any opposes? Hearing none. <laughs> Our next motion item, action item is draft fiscal year 2020-21 to 2024-25 transportation improvement program or TIP found in tab two of your agendas. Mr. Keith Kasky from Metro Plan Orlando will present the information. Please hold your questions on this action item until the presentation is finished. Go ahead, Mr. Kasky. Okay, good morning. Uh, we are asking for your approval today of the new TIP. Uh, which I had uh, previewed on the video last month, and hopefully everyone had a chance to see that. And uh, there's a link uh, on your uh, agenda that's where you can review the draft TIP. 
And then the, as the vice chairman said, there's additional information uh, in tab two. And up on the screen is one of the slides from the video that shows the amount of federal and state funds that's programmed uh, over the five years of the TIP broken out by the main categories of projects. And uh, we had our uh, virtual uh, TIP public meeting this past Monday and had a few comments. Uh, one gentleman uh, mentioned that uh, he thinks there's a need for a, a single app linking the different transportation modes, particularly links and SunRail and so on. And then there was also a comment about the uh, need for better connection between the regional trails uh, in the area. And then a lot of people had questions, uh, particularly on the status of complete streets projects, such as Corinne Drive and uh, uh, Edgewater Drive and also Orange Avenue. And then there was, so there was a lot of interest in that and also in uh, increasing the frequency of bus and rail service and so on. And uh, we'll be sending out a summary of these comments uh, separately once the uh, comment period expires on Friday. Also, we had a, a group of panelists from our local jurisdictions and agencies that were there to help us answer questions uh, at the meeting. And of course, we're grateful to all of them for their participation. And I just wanted to mention that uh, over the past three or four years when we had our uh, TIP public meetings in person, uh, we usually had an average of about 20 or so attendees, including staff and everybody. And for our virtual meeting this year, we had over 70 attendees. So we're very pleased with that and uh, felt that the uh, format worked really well. So with that, uh, unless there's any questions, uh, we are asking for your approval of the new TIP. Do we have any questions for Mr. Caskey? Dr. Stevens, I make a motion to approve. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Casmo Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, again, this will be a voice vote, so I ask that you unmute yourselves. All in favor with a response of yes? Yes. 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 Any opposes? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Our third action item is the approval of draft 2025 to 26 through 2039 to 2040 prioritized project list found in tab three of your agenda. Mr. Nick Lepp of Metro Plan Orlando staff will present this information. Please hold your questions again until the end of the presentation. Go ahead, Mr. Nick, Mr. Lepp. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Last month, I came and presented our draft project priority list, identifying those new projects um, that came into our list this year, and then identifying some of the ones that were uh, funded in what T just got adopted, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program. As a reminder, uh, our project priority list is this bridge that uh, gaps the 2040 long range plan, which is our 25 year vision with that five year transportation improvement program for the projects that are actually getting funded and ready for implementation. There has to be a direct linkage to the 2040 long range plan cost feasible plan. If the project has not been identified as cost feasible in that plan, it cannot enter our project priority list and therefore be um, eligible to get into the transportation improvement program. Uh, the plan is fiscally constrained. Uh, meaning that it anticipates available resources or revenues up through the year 2040. Um, so it does not assume that projects um, can be implemented without the funding uh, available. And then um, our project priority list is organized and uh, to support our regional priorities and then also Metro plans TMA funding policies, which I will go over in a second. Um, the way it's broken down is we have uh, roadway widenings and complete street improvements, uh, transportation systems management operation improvements, bicycle pedestrian improvements, which include safety and sun trail improvements. Now these are all on the national highway and state road system, all combined in one list, which we transmit to the Department of Transportation for them to consider in the next year's uh, work program, which you would be seeing in the next transportation improvement program. Uh, the Metro Plan TMA funding policy is something that the board has adopted where we look to break down those TMA funds, which are funds allocated directly to Metro Plan Orlando uh, for local projects for implementation. 
and that's broken down into 32% for roadways or complete streets, 17% um, for regional trails, safe routes to schools, 21% uh, for TISMO projects, and 30% for transit capital. And I'll go over, that's gonna be a little different this time, but I will go over that as we get into the transit section. Okay, any questions for Mr. Lapp? Well, actually, I was still had more. Unfortunately, my screen got stuck and the slide didn't advance. So um, I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that moved uh, within the ranking process of our performance-based planning. Um, as I reminded everybody in the last um, presentation for the preview, we have a certain set of performance measures that we use to rank projects. Now this is a very data-driven approach to making sure that projects move up that are uh, trying to achieve our targeted needs of safety, travel time reliability, but also multimodal connectivity and access to jobs and activity centers. Um, what I wanted to highlight is our top seven projects from the last project priority list remained unchanged. That's because they already had projects funded in the transportation improvement program. And it's our priority to make sure that those projects go through completion of all phases through construction before we start moving a new project into the transportation improvement program. Um, from there, I just wanted to highlight some, some moves that came in this last year, largely due to safety um, numbers and travel time reliability. So that makes our top priorities on the national highway and state roadway system, uh, State Road 436 uh, from 50 to the airport, um, uh, high, um, State Road 438, which is Silver Star Road, and this is at Hiawassee and Pine Hills. There are two intersection improvements that have moved up. Uh, Orange Ave Complete Streets, um, and this, and also an Orange Ave uh, Intersection Tismo Project at Sand Lake. Um, 46th in Sanford has also uh, moved up as an improvement, and same with uh, US 192 for more traffic uh, management system. Now, as we're looking at Metro Plan's mobility program, and this is the use of those TMA funds, uh, the top projects remained unchanged from the tip. As I explained, uh, these projects we wanna see through completion before we start moving other projects into the transportation improvement program. Uh, but some projects that moved up, largely some complete street projects like the Central Ave project in Kissimmee, uh, a downtown Orlando bike study, uh, Bell Isle uh, bike pedestrian study is a, a study that we're helping the city on right now, currently identifying some bicycle pedestrian and mobility improvements. It's still in the planning stage, but actually because of a lot of the safety and travel time issues, that project has moved up on our priority list and we'll be looking for implementation coming in the fiscal year 25, 26 timeframe. Uh, we also have uh, Mitchell Hammock, a complete street improvement through Oviedo. Uh, Orange County is looking to upgrade 160 uh, signals uh, for TISMO and technology. And then the International Drive Smart Corridor project has now started moving up on our list. Uh, for transit projects, the top projects have remained unchanged, uh, largely due to uh, unavailable operations funds. Uh, but high priority projects in the tip that are moving into the next year We'll be including uh, Meadowwoods, Tupperware, and Point Sienna Sunrail stations. Uh, we have all seen the presentation that the parking is over capacity at these three locations. Metro Plan is partnering with Orange County and Osceola County to develop a feasibility study on how can we provide more parking within these locations and understanding the importance and how much it has moved up within our priority list. Uh, we're also looking to implement the design and construction within this tip um, to satisfy that. Uh, Lynx is also looking to expand their ITS customer information system, travel parking system, and overall system expansion for uh, asset management. So that is our new project priority list, which uh, we have a link within your agenda. If you have any questions, I would be uh, happy to answer them at this time. No questions? Um, yeah. I see Mr. O'Hanlon's um, hand raised, Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. O'Hanlon, you're recognized. This is a little troublesome to me. And I realize we're talking about cost feasible. The difficulty is, is by 2040, there probably will be zero gas taxes because there probably will be zero gas cars left. So what are we using to fund this? 
So right now we are currently still operating off of our 2040 long range plan. Um, we are in the midst of updating that 2045 long range plan or MTP, which Alex will go into some of the, the details later on in presentations, but we are limited right now to the projects that have been identified back five years ago, recognizing that um, things have changed and we are gonna start looking at technology and revenues, um, but that is part of the scenario planning exercise of the MTP and will be reflected in the next project priority list as we're developing it. Okay. Ms. Horn, I can't see the participants list right now, so are there any other hands? We do not have any other hands at this point, Mr. Vice Chair. I think that was that was our only question. Moving forward, I will entertain a motion to accept the presentation. Move. Dr. Stevens, I'll make the motion to uh, approve the uh, prioritized list. Thank you, Dr. Second. Scott Zuberic, I will second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Again, if and again, again, Mr. Vice Chair, I do not see any hands raised for, for any discussion on that. At this time, I'll entertain the vote. So if you will uh, unmute yourselves and for approvals, I have a acknowledgement, please. Approvals? Yes. 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 Aye. Any opposition? Areas. Our final action item is the approval of Metro Plan Orlando CAV readiness study found in tab four in your agenda packets. Mr. Eric Hill of Metro Plan Orlando staff will present this information. Please again hold your question to the end of the presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am uh, going to provide you with the final recommendations on our connected and autonomous vehicle study. Um, this, I am trying to move uh, the slides, uh, but I cannot move them. So if I could get some assistance with going to the introduction slide for this presentation. Thank you. Um, this is uh, the final, uh, the wrap up. We're in the home stretch of this study. Um, and this study is to look at how uh, our region is getting prepared for connected and autonomous vehicle technology. Um, and I emphasize that only because there are millions of questions swirling around this, this subject. And the purpose of this study was not to answer the questions, but to see how we can prepare ourselves for this technology. Next slide. So again, this is to look at how we can prepare ourselves. And uh, we had uh, four tasks that we had as part of this study. It resulted in some foundational research as well as some workshops um, that helped us engage the public because we wanted to understand how the agencies are getting prepared. We wanted to understand how the public is getting prepared, the end users of this technology. And uh, I want to, uh, you know, share some of the, the, the credit in, in the work that we accomplished here. We had a steering committee uh, made up of uh, Frank Consoli, City of Sanford, uh, Brett Blackadar, City of Altamont Springs, Hazem Alazar, Orange County, Tanya Olori and Alex Laffey, Osceola County, Tom O'Hanlon, uh, representing the CAC, uh, was on our steering committee, uh, Robert Melia, who's a citizen uh, advocate and system user of the paratransit service. John Lott represented Lynx. Uh, Virginia Whittington at Metro Plan Orlando represented the, the MAC committee. And uh, I also wanted to thank our Metro Plan Orlando staff that certainly uh, did a lot of work with the public involvement piece. The prime consultant that we uh, did the work for us was WSP. And I have Alan Danaher with me this morning. And uh, Global Five was the subconsultant on the study. Next slide. So 
For anyone new to this technology, connected vehicle communicates with other vehicles, the infrastructure, smartphones held by pedestrians, cyclists, and wheelchair occupants. GM OnStar system has been in existence for two decades and is an early example of connectivity. If you're in an accident, the technology can automatically alert and operate it to assist you. The future of potential of con connectivity will rely on super fast communications where vehicles can talk to each other, to the roadside and to mobile devices. Now, many of you over the years have heard me say that I'm infatuated with technology, uh, but not in love with it. Because the theory here is if commuters, computers can talk to each other through vehicles, that we won't have any crashes. Well, you know, humans talk to each other all the time and we still have these crashes. Next slide. Driving is a series of decisions and actions. When you string these tasks all together, you're able to drive. Technology is rapidly becoming available to start reducing some of these tasks, such as lane departure warning, parking assist, automatic emergency braking, and even advanced cruise control systems that can adapt if the vehicle in front of you is slowing down. The next generation of automated vehicle technology that is already getting ready to hit the roads will provide more and more assistance to point where it can manage complex decisions, reactions, and route to the eventual to eventual self-driving capabilities. Next slide. The fully autonomous self-driving vehicle of the future may not need a steering wheel and pedals for acceleration for accelerating or braking. It will be connected automated vehicle or CAV that combines all capabilities of connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Now, it, technology evolves all the time and this space is going to continue to evolve. And when we first started down this path, uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers created these levels of autonomy. There were five levels of autonomy. They were very technical, descriptive um, and over the last few years, I think is as an industry, we've kind of moved away from that to something that's more simple and how we define these levels of autonomy or, or self-driving vehicles. So we first start with just safe driving and that's where we currently are, where we have driving assistance and that includes hands on the wheel, feet on pedals at all times. Uh, what we are moving into is self-driving. And sometimes you can have your hands off the wheel. You can have your feet off the pedal. And eventually we'll get to a self-driving vehicle. Next slide. So uh, in the first technical memorandum, uh, we complete an analysis of CAV best practices to provide base findings that can be applied to Central Florida. This is some foundational research that helped identify core needs of, of successful CAV projects around the country, making sure that they are feasible, innovative, safe, satisfy local need, and recognize the need for regional, for regional equity. Found that other agencies around the country are starting to consider CAV technologies to inform the decision-making process for funding and development, and that many will match local needs and capabilities, which emerging to, uh, industry trends. In addition to these conclusions, we also had the opportunity to share best practices for other regions and agencies to build planning expertise that goes beyond technology development assessment. For the second technical memorandum, more than a dozen transportation engineers, managers, and planners in our region were interviewed about the roadway infrastructure, staffing proficiency, system and network capabilities, potential CAV testing locations, training plans, and equity challenges. Next slide. And based on the earlier task, we concluded that the region-wide region collaboration training, uh, consistent use of technology and equity solutions are needed to be CAV ready. We then took those preliminary ideas into public workshops to explore further. Next slide. Next. 
as noted earlier, uh, we had uh, three workshops in uh, each of the counties. Uh, attendees, uh, as attendees entered each workshop location, display boards told the story of why CAV readiness is needed. Define the differences between connected autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles. Attendees also had opportunity to take a 10 question survey soliciting their opinion about riding and CAVs, safety policy concerns, and how they think CAVs could impact their surroundings. We provided a presentation during each workshop, which defined again, these various uh, levels of automated driving and also presented findings from the completed technical memorandums that reviewed CAV industry best practices and evaluated existing local capabilities. This concluded with some question and answers. Attendees uh, with smartphones were provided access to live polling website, which produced results in real time uh, that, we was, that we displayed on the presentation screen. Next slide. And here are some of the results. Uh, you can see that the attendees uh, were favorable to this technology. And uh, we found this to be refreshing in the sense that uh, over the years, there's been this, this concern. Uh, and most of the concerns have been around security and privacy. Uh, I know AAA has been uh, tracking uh, their users' uh, reaction or interest or fear of this technology for the last three or four years. And um, it has changed. It's dramatically changed from when they first started asking this question of their members to as recent as last year, where now they are starting to see this as the future. Uh, they are embracing it. Um, and it's, it's something that once you understand it, once you feel and touch it, um, that fear starts to, starts to wane. Next slide. And so in the public engagement, uh, these were some of the biggest concerns. It was safety, privacy, data, uh, security. And, and these are ones that, again, these are, they go, they rise to the top of the list of concerns, usually when you bring this up with the general public. Um, vehicle te technology de development, workforce training and data storage. The interesting thing about vehicles now they are, in a sense, just your, your smartphone on wheels. They are constantly grabbing data, sending data, and that's what we, as on the public side, we want, because we want to know how transportation is being consumed, because transportation needs to be looked at as a utility that's being consumed. And so how do we allocate, become better in terms of Econ economics in terms of sharing this resource and making it available. So um, the other opportunity here is just educating the public and some training and the training and equity sharing. This is all what came out of the interviews that we did with uh, the planners and the engineers. Next slide. So here are the recommendations uh, that came out of the work. Um, we, and I'll go a little further into each of these planning and policy, infrastructure guidelines, data collection management, pilot projects, staff, staffing and training. Next slide. So executive guidance. This is where we want to engage our committees, our board members, awareness and periodic engagement from senior leadership representing all the stakeholder agencies is necessary to ma maintain this momentum because we're starting down this road now, uh, no pun intended, um, and it's becoming more aware um, or we're becoming more aware of it and how it will impact our lives as well as our work. While each agency will undoubtedly have their own priorities and unique challenges, there will be many common themes and opportunities that are best achieved through executive leadership. So again, this is a area for policy development and there are certainly opportunities. There's uh, information that's available for us to, to get some work done in this area. Um, as you all know, we are uh, in the midst of, our, up, of the update of our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. And we certainly 
uh, hope that these uh, look for these recommendations to find their way into uh, the plan document. CAV applications will be continually evolving with new technologies emerging. Local jurisdictions will need to meet need to become more familiar with addressing infrastructure and communication improvements to foster CAV. Integration into planning activities being undertaken by Metro Plan Orlando, as well as other regional partners uh, in our area will need to embrace this and start to plan for this technology. Next slide. Continuing under planning and policy, Site development. CAVs bring great opportunities to transform the built environment in ways that were, where appropriate, can refocus communities toward the needs of humans instead of the movement of automobiles. CAVs will change the way users access their vehicles, bring reductions in demand, and space needed for parking, yield opportunities for road diets, such as complete streets, uh, which is one of our focus areas and require major redesigns to transportation corridors and development sites to accommodate passenger drop-off and pickup. Uh, one of the uh, planning focus areas for the department is what they were referring to as routes of significance. And, and under this, this policy is to look at those routes, those particular roadways that are right for bringing in more technology in advance for the, the coming of connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, parking uh, is when, in the report, the report itself spends a lot of time talking about how it will impact parking. And I think one of the areas that you have to be concerned about parking is, uh, well, not, on the one hand, you can remove a lot of parking, but on the other hand, parking is a revenue for some jurisdictions, a big revenue source for some jurisdictions. So they have to be balanced. Uh, the other one is how do you deal with information in commercial signage? Um, there's some discussion of making uh, drivers, making pedestrians, making cyclists aware, uh, more aware that connected or automated vehicles are operating in a space and to just be more mindful of that and how these vehicles and where these vehicles can operate. Equity. Equity is one that is near and dear to, to my heart, certainly, uh, because uh, you talk about vertical equity and you're talking about social economics. And we want to make sure that this technology doesn't go over uh, underserved communities, uh, which is which has been historically the case uh, in our in our industry. In terms of horizontal equity, um, not all of the jurisdictions have the resources to put infrastructure in to maintain that infrastructure, to bring in the staff skills to support uh, infrastructure for connected and autonomous vehicles. So the, the, the region itself will start to, or need to have that discussion on how to balance the needs for the larger governments versus the smaller governments that, that may not have those resources. And this is just, a, this is just an area for us to, to be more coordinated and to work more closely together. And uh, just to return back to that vertical equity, one of our performance measurements that uh, Metro Plan Orlando initiated um, is environmental justice. And so here's an opportunity for us to look at how well we're meeting that, that goal. Next slide. Roadway infrastructure requirements and guidelines are a key component to successfully deploying CAV technologies and ensuring interoperability throughout the Metroplan Orlando planning area. This includes updated signing, pavement markings, as well as traffic signal hardware. Um, you heard uh, in Nick's presentation that uh, some of the projects that are coming, um, coming into fruition now include upgrading our signal technology uh, to work in, in to work with connected and autonomous vehicles, pavement marking uh, maintaining that will be important because uh, these vehicles rely on uh, sensors to see things, and so stop signs, you know, uh, painted or pavement markings need to be maintained so that these vehicles, the sensors, can read those and understand where they are. 
These technologies are part of larger TISMO and intelligent transportation system framework, which supports the safe and efficient movement of people and goods throughout Metroplan Orlando. As these technologies are further developed, guidelines that define the role within the framework will be needed. Maintenance, again, uh, the deployment of this technology will bring additional maintenance responsibilities for local jurisdictions, the state and private industry partners. Clear guidance is needed to define who will maintain this. This equipment and training will be required for those performing maintenance on newly deployed TAV technologies. Um, this again is one of the areas where we as, as an NPO, we can capitalize a lot of the infrastructure, but the maintenance and continuing upgrade training is a local responsibility. So the concern for how resource, resources are allocated will be new. Next slide. Data, data governance. Uh, includes this, includes assistance for managing data as well as decision making authority on data policies and data stewardship. The ultimate responsibility for data governance for the region should be at the state level with FDOT setting clear and consistent guidance. Now, this again is part of the recommendations and since uh, given the, the, the reach of the department, we, uh, we can work in partnership with the department in developing this type of governance. In terms of data uh, storage, collection and storage, as vehicles infrastructure and other objects in the transportation system become increasingly more connected, there will be ample opportunities to collect data via information that is transmitted for other purposes. Um, some of you may be familiar with the phrase smart cities, smart communities. Well, they're all basing that on data, information, how that information is collected and then put out to society. Well, the basis of that is certainly the transportation infrastructure because it exists everywhere. Um, and a lot of the data goes through the transportation right away. Uh, so how can we work in partnerships with local jurisdictions that address other societal needs will be critical, which is the next one, which is data sharing. Uh, policies on whether and how to share data with entities other than agencies collecting and storing data will be will need to be determined in order to support novel uses of CAV data while protecting data value, privacy, and security. And uh, leading into the last one, collecting, storing, and sharing, and this data brings with, with it the responsibility to ensure this information is protected. Learning from the best practices elsewhere, including other industries, agencies within the region will need to implement strong systems to maintain data security. Next slide. Pilot projects. Um, we have several in our area. And with the advent of uh, this technology, new opportunities uh, to test this technology through pilot projects should be undertaken. And this is encouraged through the recommendations. Uh, this will build on initial efforts uh, led by the department, especially along uh, State Road 434 uh, in Seminole County and the University of Central Florida campus. And um, this the project that's going on at University of, Cent uh, University of Central Florida. This is the ATTAIN project. And some of you may recall two years ago, we received a $11.9 million federal grant to expand or enhance uh, the use of technology. And so uh, a lot of it is focused in East Orange County, uh, but it looks at pedestrian safety. It looks at roadway safety. It looks at a, a making smarter communities, giving people alternative trip making uh, uh, possibilities, um, it, and also a what's called SunStore. And this is where all this data is going to be collected and used to analyze the system, but also improve the system. So uh, there's a, a lot of encouragement coming uh, out of these recommendations to do more testing, to look at pilot uh, studies. And uh, certainly the federal government or the Federal Highway Administration certainly likes, uh, likes that idea. And perhaps one of the easiest ways for us to, to move further into this area is to start to uh, use our fleet vehicles. Um, you know, I remember um, you know, back when you had the um, the brake light in the center of your 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 back window. 
I can remember when they were developing that, it was local jurisdictions that were testing that technology. And so just using that as, as a model, uh, we can put uh, or retrofit a lot of our fleet vehicles at the jurisdictions um, with onboard devices that in essence are aftermarket connected vehicles. Uh, this is being done uh, in Tampa uh, with a connected vehicle study that they're doing with the expressway where they've invited um, participants that have had their vehicles retrofitted so that they could be connected vehicles. Uh, we can invite partnerships uh, working with uh, your, your logistics companies like a UPS or FedEx, uh, which are already equipped with technology. Uh, and then uh, using, you know, pedestrians as well as cyclists that can, you know, be equipped with, or at least it's a smartphone app that they can use that can also allow us to be connected. Next slide. So uh, recruitment and retention, widespread adoption of, of the technology is expected to have varying impacts on workforce needs, including already emerging, emerging challenges of finding, attracting, and retaining employees with the right skill sets needed to operate, maintain, manage, and plan the transportation network. Meeting this challenge will require incorporating lessons learned from other regions and parts of the country into in, including investing in local training programs, promoting staff engagement and growth and exploring new ways to hire qualified applicants. Training, while one potential solution to supporting the recruitment and retention of qualified applicants will be to enhance training of existing and potential staff, training in some new types of skill sets is not yet widely available. Much of the training can be built built up within the region as experience in these emerging fields begins to grow. But it will also be important, particularly in the short term, to look elsewhere for training opportunities and knowledge sharing of lessons. Next slide. So what's next? So these recommendations presented are, for, are far reaching, but the overall intention is to build policies, procedures that will help guide agencies within the Metropolitan Orlando planning area through the induction, introduction and adoption of CAV technologies. The next generation of mobility applications and technologies continue to evolve and improve. The timeline for CAV introduction and adoption will be impacted by the readiness of technology and also the readiness of the regulatory environment. Coupled, of course, with the receptiveness of overall public, who are the ultimate users. Metro Plan, Hand, Metro Plan Orlando has the opportunity to act as an information conduit to help share best practices from other regions and agencies. It can also be a convener to foster collaboration and build a planning expertise that goes beyond technology development assessment by implementing the recommendation. Next slide. It's worth noting that the recommendations may not be implemented in the same way or on the same timeline by all regional agencies. Each organization is currently at a different level of capability and maturity with this technology and may have different priorities uh, for the types of outcomes they would like to see first. While some agencies are already conducting real world pilot tests, others are still wrapping their heads around basic terminology. Therefore, an action item that might be longer term for one agent could be near term for another agency. And the importance of these recommendations, however, is to put the full menu in front of all regional agencies, stakeholders more broadly so they can pick and choose what suits their current capability and status. And for the region to coordinate on a common set of actions, recognizing they won't all be accomplished at the same time across every agency or jurisdiction. The implementation of recommendations will depend on funding availability as well as integration with other ongoing equipment infrastructure up, upgrades and how they could be modified in a cost effective way to best pursue the overall investment while enabling future trends in transportation like CAVs. So Mr. Chairman, um, that is the end of, of my presentation and I am here for questions and answers, um, or to answer any questions, and I'll take any comments 
And also I do have Alan Danaher with me from WSP, who if you have a real technical question about this, um, I will uh, defer it to him. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, um, so, Mr. Vice Chair, I think we have uh, hands up now from Dan Stevens and Alyssa Council and Tom O'Hanlon. Well, let's start with Dr. Stevens. Dr. Stevens, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'd like to first off uh, thank uh, Mr. Hill and uh, his group for a uh, uh, job well done. I do have a question, um, uh, two questions actually. Uh, I heard um, twice uh, this uh, concerns raised about uh, revenue. You know, how are we gonna pay for things? Now, I, do, I certainly don't question, um, you know, the direction that we're going with regards to the uh, autonomous vehicles, the connected vehicles. Uh, that's without question. However, um, echoing a uh, concern raised by Tom O'Hanlon earlier regarding the uh, declining tax uh, gas tax receipts, you know, and uh, his question was pertained to how we're going to pay for, you know, certain uh, projects. Um, I heard it echoed with you, Mr. Hill, when you mentioned parking, and you said specifically that some jurisdictions rely on parking revenues, and it was almost framed as so it was an obstacle. I think that's a key to any kind of a study like this, is to um, do a SWOT analysis to determine not only you know how can we do this, but how can we address or mitigate any challenges of that. We need to make sure that those rev you know that those jurisdictions that are counting on these revenues that they've got alternative sources. Otherwise, they are going to you know be against those kind of uh, actions. So uh, comments on that. So that those were your two questions, correct? Uh, how uh, the revenue will be impacted, um, and then also uh, two sources of revenue will be impacted, fuel revenue as well as parking revenue, correct? Well, in, in a general sense, I mean, that's just something we need to consider is when we're, when we're trying to implement, you know, these changes, we need to say, okay, well, who stands the benefit? Like, for example, the uh, rental car surcharge, um, you know, the airport relies on a lot of that for their, um, for their building. So of course, you know, it becomes a political hot potato because they don't want to, you know, lose all this revenue. So I think in a broad sense, if we address these kind of problems and make sure that these entities still can survive without that particular revenue, I think that would alleviate a lot of these challenges. Right. And, and the first recommendation was uh, executive leadership. Uh, and, and you're right, uh, and Mr. Hanlon brought it up earlier or in the last presentation uh, that um, the current model that we are operating under, uh, and many of you that have been, you know, I've been in Metro Plan Atlanta 20, 21 years, and I remember, and I know some of your faces and I've known them for many years, but you heard me say that, you know, we are now in the 21st century and the model that we're currently operating under the funding model is a 20th century model. And, you know, as things change, uh, you have to adapt. And that is, again, the, 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 the tenor of this study, again, was not to answer questions, but to make you aware. And so I will take that your comments, you have made, this study has made you aware of how this technology is going to impact the revenue that we, the revenue sources, the revenue model that we currently use to fund our transportation network. Now, uh, chances are these vehicles are gonna be electric vehicles. So that's gonna be a decline in the fuel tax. And again, if these vehicles are vehicles that are operating as, as, as um, transportation network companies uh, that you know, are going, dropping people off and picking people up, well, there's a reduction in parking revenue. Uh, so perhaps there is a, a, an opportunity for local jurisdictions to modify their curb space regulations, policies, and guidelines so that there is a revenue tied to connected vehicles coming to a drop-off pickup point. 
maybe there's just like airplanes come into an airport and they land, they, they pay fees, right? Well, maybe there's an opportunity to put something like that in place. And yeah, parking, uh, and speaking of airports, um, I have a friend that works for Tampa International Airport and, and we were talking one time and she said, you know, what's the second largest source of our revenue? You, and she said, she joked with me, she said, you should know this. And I said, yeah, parking. So that again, gives you a sense of how this technology will impact not only, you know, how we travel, the decisions we made to make, the decision process that we use to make trip decisions, and then the impact that it's gonna have on local economies in many ways. And again, there are, the questions are, you know, out there. Uh, but this study, again, is to make us aware and to get us ready. And I think, it's, I believe it's done a, a great job of doing it, of just pointing out things that we need to prepare for. And, and based on your comments, I, I think it's made you aware, a little bit more aware. Mr. O'Hanlon, you're recognized. Thank you, Eric. I think the, the study is definitely making people aware um, the challenge that awaits all of us is the speed that this is taking place is accelerating so fast, uh, even going faster than I thought. But I wanna hit on you know the big item everybody has and they always ask me is about safety. Well, the first quarter national highway statistics are out. And the last time I spoke to you, I told you it was six times safer to let my car drive me. It is now 10 times safer to let my car drive me. And the improvements just continue to come. I'm gonna tell you a story of a video that I watched and I made sure I turned this on on my car that you almost can't even believe. The Tesla watches everything that occurs 360 degrees around the car, including not only the car in front of it, but generally two or three cars in front of it that you can't even see. Anyway, the third car in front of it gets into an accident, crashes the second car in front of it, and the car in front of it crashes. Well, of course, the Tesla stops 40 or 50 feet behind the car in front of it that just crashed. The only problem is the guy behind the Tesla wasn't paying attention, was about to slam into his car, and I've got this turned on in my car right now, to give my car permission to floor it and jump 30 feet in front of it so the, so the Tesla didn't get into an accident with the car behind it. And the only way this can happen is obviously you gotta give the car permission to do it. And that's real easy, it's just a switch, okay? It's because the Tesla knows everything going on around it and it makes decisions in a millionth of a second that a human just can't do. It's just amazing. And then you get into some other issues. And Eric, we haven't talked in a while because there's a lot of other issues. When my car comes to a stop sign, okay? And if a gas car next to it just keeps on creeping forward, my car won't go unless those cars are stopped. So you're gonna have this problem for the time when you've got other cars out there that aren't self-driving. They're just gonna cut off all the self-driving cars because the self-driving car won't come unless they stop. An issue for the future. And then we talk about this eventually, like, yeah, it's gonna happen in our lifetime. My car is going to get traffic circle driving probably in about three weeks. The only thing left is making right and left turns on local streets. And Eric, I cannot fathom the thought it's not happening before this year is out. The car drives absolutely everywhere by itself. So I, I know Detroit, and the press and everybody else is saying, you know, basically this is not gonna happen. Detroit's thinking about putting together between all of them, only a half a million electric cars by 2026. Well, by next year, Tesla's gonna be making several million just by itself. That's how fast this is happening. And the reason it's gonna happen, is not Tesla. It's the fact that the economic costs of electric cars are falling through the floor. An example, my car today costs $25,000 less than when I bought it. And by next year, it'll be five or 10,000 less than that. It will be cheaper than its corresponding gas car. 
and not only cheaper, and 10 to maybe 50 to 100 times safer than a gas car. And I know, Eric, you and I discussed this equality thing. Gas, electric cars are going to be so cheap. This is going to be the big equalizer. And I will grant you that the folks that have it now are ahead of everybody, and maybe that's not equal. But within a few years, when these cars are so cheap, it's going to be a major equalizer amongst society. Now, Mr. Hanlon, that Mr. Hanlon, that was not a question, correct? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. It was just an update, Eric, because I don't get to see you because you can't get into the office. But I just want our committee to understand how quickly this is really going to happen. And it's not whether the government, you know, you know, puts in the infrastructure for connected vehicles, which is important. And Central Florida is doing a great job. I'm very happy with that. It's going to happen due to sheer economics. Electric cars are becoming so cheap, you can't afford to buy a gas car. And that's why I'm so worried about the revenue. Hmm. Because everybody thinks, oh, yeah, there's going to be some electric cars. No, they're becoming so cheap. Everyone will have electric cars. And then there's no gas tax revenue. Thank you, Mr. O'Hanlon. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, we uh, have Melissa Council waiting with a question. Ms. Council, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh you're, you're muted. You're muted. Ms. Council, you're muted. There you go. I'm there so go. sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Hill. Great presentation. Thank you. I have a question in regards to areas like Marigold. I know I'm always bringing it up to you and I'm always on it, but in this area, there's not signal lights and some of the signs are obstructed with trees or um, things that don't catch the whole reflection. With this autonomous car vehicles and buses that they're planning to put in this area, will they be doing the making one of the pilot project areas, this Ponciana area down here on the Marigold side? I, I don't know of any uh, that are currently planned, uh, but as, one of the, as in the recommendations, we talk about pilot and, and testing. Um, the study itself, and I didn't go into the detail, but the study itself identifies certain areas in each, each of the counties and in several of the jurisdictions um, where there are some recommendations or suggestions on pilot studies that the local jurisdictions should pursue or as a region we should pursue. Um, but I don't recall, and I can't recall if that area is one, but I can follow up and I can provide you uh, some information on some of the uh, areas that the study recommends as sites for pilot studies. I, I can get that to you. Thank you so much, because this is a growing area on the Marigold side. And that's the amount of accidents since last year that we spoke about it to this year. And these are people in normal cars. These are not self-driving cars. So if, like they said before, th the car is already, you know, going straight, going backwards, doing a whole bunch of stuff. It's only a matter of time before they start making left and right turns. But areas like this, which there was a horrible accident here last week, a lot of people are not paying attention to, and there's no lights. So cars that self-driving with people that are not paying attention, and then there's not signals, there's not um, reflectors that I don't see what kind of, this is going to turn into. So my, my question is, please, can this area be looked at? Yeah, Miss Miss Council, uh, you said uh, you mentioned reflectors. You mentioned lights. Are you talking about traffic light or street lights? Signal lights. Signal, signal lights. lights. Okay. There's no signal lights all down Marable, like I had explained to you before. So with autonomous cars, uh, cars that need uh you know, um, they, need, they, need to able, they need to be able to see these, these, uh, yes. these parts of the infrastructure. Yeah, you're, yes. you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. Ms. Council for that. Thank you, Eric. Fantastic presentation. Uh, this is our final action item, so I need to entertain a motion to accept this presentation. I make a motion to approve. 
Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Who is the motion maker and seconder? Tom Three seconds. Scott made the motion. Tom is second. Okay. At this point, I'll ask everyone to unmute as this is a voice vote again. All in favor, please. Aye. 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 Any opposes? Hearing none, motion carries. As I said, this Thanks. is a final action item. And we will Thank move now straight into the, pre the um, presentations. We have three today. Our first presentation is a two-part presentation update from on the 2045 Metro Plan uh, by Ms. Laura Bach of Metro Plan. Orlando staff will lead us off. Go ahead, Laura. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, all right, thank you. I was having trouble unmuting. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. I am back with you again this morning to give you the second installment of my update on our congestion management process uh, update that we're doing this year. And I wanted to go ahead and get us started off with, once again, a definition of what it, I mean when I'm talking about congestion management so that we're all on the same page and what it is that we're trying to do, which is to improve the performance and reliability of our transportation system by reducing the negative impacts of both recurring and non-recurring congestion. Um, before I talk about that, I wanted to just have a brief snapshot of where we are today. So every year, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute puts out an urban mobility report. And in their latest report from 2019, uh, the city of Orlando, which we're going to go ahead and use as a proxy for our planning area, was ranked as the 28th most congested city in the U.S. So the average driver spending about 57 hours of their driving time stuck in congestion annually, which uh, accounts for about a monetized loss of about $1,100 per person annually. Well, I think we can do better. We, we want to do better. And that's where our congestion management process comes in. Um, the congestion management process is a performance-based way for us to approach planning for congestion management. The CMP provides a mechanism for us to ensure that our investment decisions are made with a clear focus on what our desired outcomes are. So the last time that I was with you, I presented an overview, pardon me, an overview of the entire congestion management process uh, based on the eight-step model that FHWA put together. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is really the performance measures that we have developed as a part of the congestion management process, and that's what the rest of my presentation is going to focus on. So the performance measures are really the bedrock of our congestion management process. Once we have an approved CMP, I'll be coming back to you periodically to report out on our performance measures so we can see if the various strategies that we're using are moving us in the right direction with respect to congestion management. Um, and we'll be making recommendations about how we should be changing those strategies based on how we're doing with respect to these performance measures. So what we're measuring really matters. Um, so with that said, as we have been defining our measures, the things that we've been thinking about are making sure that they are multimodal, um, making sure that they're consistent with federal guidance, making sure that they're consistent with our long range planning and the 2045 MTV, MTP, pardon me, and perhaps most consistently making sure that we are choosing measures where data is readily available, um, won't be too expensive to get and where it won't take too much staff time. Depending on the measure, we'll be collecting data anywhere from quarterly to annually. So it's important that the data is readily available. So a reminder, you're all familiar now with our sort of five goal areas associated with our MTP. And I'll be um, talking about each of the performance measures associated with those goal areas in turn. Starting off with safety and security. Um, so for safety and security, we know that safety is one of our top priorities as an agency and as a region. With respect to congestion management, crashes in particular are important because they impact non-recurring congestion. And that's something that we're trying to uh, minimize and eliminate. So to that, um, 
point, we have two objectives that we've identified. One is the eliminating the rate and occurrence of fat fatality crashes, injury crashes, and total crashes. And so the performance measures we'll be looking at with respect to that objective relate to both the number of crashes and the crash rate by mode. Um, the other objective that we'll be trying to meet are improving our emergency response time and incident clearance times. And so we'll be working with our partners um, quarterly to collect data on the emergency response time, which is the time from when there's notification that an incident has occurred to when that first responder arrives on the scene. And we'll also be tracking our incident clearance time, which is the time for when that first responder gets there to when we have all clear lanes. Moving on to our next goal area, reliability and performance, we have a number of um, objectives related to this goal area. And so I've sort of broken them up into two different areas. First, starting with our reliability related objectives. Um, we know that there are fluctuations every day in our travel time to work or to wherever you go on a regular basis. And oh, I went too far. Um, we want to really try and minimize how much that travel time is fluctuated on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what we talk about when we're talking about system reliability. And to that, to that extent, the performance measures we'll be pursuing include um, system reliability, what percentage of our corridors in our system are reliable, both interstate and non-interstate, what's the reliability for, for trucks, for our freight, um, but it's the hours of delay for the total system. And then on the transit side, what's the on-time performance for SunRail and for our buses? Um, the next set of objectives is sort of what I'm calling our, pardon me, went too far, our future ready objectives. Um, the first one there is trying to expand our ITS capabilities and uh, the amount of actively managed tra traffic systems we have. And the measure we'll be looking at is our actively monitored roadways. And that includes uh, roadways that have Bluetooth, that are part of FDOT's integrated corridor management system, that have um, CCTV, dynamic messaging systems. So we'll be tracking the percentage of corridors that meet that definition. Um, the other objective is one that's been interesting, and that's um, adapting to meet our changing traveler needs and desires. Um, the things that we could be looking at include um, the amount of ridership on TNCs, on Uber, Lyft. Um, we could be looking at uh, the percentage of facilities we have to connect to electric vehicles, um, shared mobility, electric bikes, uh, scooters, um, and what Eric just presented about uh, the percentage of our system that's ready to support CAVs. Well, for a lot of those measures, there isn't really data available, but in one area that we do have data available uh, is with the city of Orlando who has deployed scooters and e-bikes. And so we'll be using that as a performance measure, but moving forward as we're hoping that there'll be better da data available for our TNCs and we'll start to define what it means to be CAV ready for a corridor. Those are performance measures that may move into the CMP as we start to be able to get better data related to them. Um, moving on to our next goal area, which is access and connectivity. This is another area where we have quite a few different objectives. Um, so first, our sort of access related objectives, um, where we're looking at improving access to both high frequency transit, as well as improving access to our essential services across all modes. Um, some of the measures that we'll be looking at, including include looking at our average fixed route frequency for, tra for transit, looking at the percentage of route miles for our fixed route services by frequency. So what percentage are 15 minute headways, what percentage are 30 minute headways, that sort of thing. We'll be looking at the percentage of jobs and population that are close to high frequency transit. And then we'll be looking at um, access to essential services, which include things like grocery stores, convenience stores, pharmacies, um, government facilities, schools, that sort of thing. And actually this graphic that I have at the bottom of this slide shows specifically for bicycle and pedestrian access, um, the, the areas that have a 10 minute access by a bicycle trip or a walking trip within the region. Um, so as you can see, that's not a lot is shaded in yellow. So we'll be looking to see how that improves as we move along and we implement different strategies. The next uh, sort of pot of objectives under our access and connectivity goals include our, our connectivity objectives. Um, so we'll be looking at increasing um, the frequency of more of our transit services as, as we have budget for, increasing ridership on transit, 
reducing our per capita vehicle miles travel and reducing our reliance on single occupancy vehicles. And so the performance measures we'll be looking at relate to all of those things, including um, looking at the amount of money that we as an agency, Metro Plan Orlando, is spending um, out of our TMA funds to support the board emphasis areas because we really think that gets back to um, how we develop our transportation system that reflects our regional and community values. And the board emphasis areas include um, things like reaching out to our younger populations, safety, supporting SunRail, that sort of thing. You could see in the graphic at the bottom sort of how we've been doing over the last few years. So we'll be looking at tracking that moving forward. Uh, the next goal area is health and environment. And we have one objective there and uh, that relates to congestion management. Um, and that'll be reducing our pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. And so we'll be um, tracking our CO2 emissions, ozone, particulate matter, and other greenhouse gas emissions um, to the extent that we can find data for those things. And finally, uh, the final goal area is investment and economic opportunity. And so what we'll be looking at there in terms of performance measures are the hours and cost of delay. That goes back to my, my second slide where we looked at the 57 hours of delay on average per person, $1,100. We'll be looking at how that changes as we implement new strategies related to congestion management. Um, the other performance measure we'll be looking at is our visitor emphasis corridors. And the, the graphic at the right of the slide uh, shows the sort of the darker green are the, the corridors that have the highest percentages of volume that comes from visitor traffic. So we'll be looking at those corridors in particular to see what the reliability is on those corridors. So that was a fast and furious overview of what our performance measures are. Where we are right now in our update uh, process is we're finishing up all of our data collection to set a baseline for each of the performance measures. And we're also um, doing our analyses to look at where we have current hotspots with respect to congestion and with respect to places where we need to improve the transportation system. And so I anticipate coming back to present to you at the next round of meetings um, to talk about where those hotspots are and also to present on the strategies that we're recommending be considered for moving into the MTP and into our prioritized project list. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, I see a hand up from um, Theo Webster. Hey, Ms. Oh. Webster, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with obviously um, what we're currently going through and how that's going to affect <laughs> your data and many of the things that you spoke about. Um, I know you can't tell me specifically all the answers, but what is your feel for how the pandemic and some of the disrupt other disruptions um, are going to affect this process? Um, I, I like that question. I will say that I spent a lot of time reworking the beginning of this presentation to figure out how I wanted to talk about that. Obviously, there are a lot of things that are still up in the air. We're not sure how various things are going to um, change, really throughout the pandemic and post pandemic. So what I would say, um, the thing that gives me the most hope with respect to the CMP is it is a living document. It's something that we'll be updating annually at a minimum. Um, and so I think when we get to that, we'll have an approved CMP and then next year we'll be talking about, are we measuring the right things? Are we moving the needle? Should we be looking at something different? So I think we'll have that ongoing opportunity to sort of reset and reflect on what needs to change within what we're doing to manage congestion. I don't think, or I know I don't have any solid answers right now, but I think we'll be able to, to sort of be nimble with respect to this process. Mr. O'Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lara, I, I, I like most of what you've got. I would like to request we add um, two more performance measures. Okay. The, first of, the first of which will be real easy to add, and that is um, the number of passenger trips by autonomous vehicles, and just start that now and the number is going to be zero, because by the end of the year that may not be zero, um, and then two, uh, the amount of emissions reductions by electric vehicles, especially CO2 reduction, because see, electric vehicles will eliminate climate change due to man. 
because it's going to reduce emissions so much. It's amazing. Okay, but let's start thanks. tracking it now while, you know, while we can still get the data. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I appreciate your suggestions. Um, I think I'll have to have to come some conversations probably with you as well so we can talk about the best sources for that data. Yes, well, when I come yeah. in and talk to you folks, just tell me, I can come down. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay. Spock, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate thank you sharing that with us. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Bob? I do not see any hands, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, well, moving on. Our next presentation is Mr. Alex uh, Traurig from Metro Orlando staff. Um, status on the planning task, technical activities uh, of Metro plan staff. Go ahead, Mr. Traurig. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different of a presentation than I've provided, um, you know, at your past meetings earlier this year and late last year, as I'm basically going to be providing a status update on really work to date and what we're going to be doing as, you know, we look into the next few months um, for adoption in the rest of the year. So I won't be, uh, you know, tackling one topic for 20 plus minutes. I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes with you just providing a general overview. Um, as I've presented in the past, um, you know, the long range plan, the metropolitan transportation plan is a, is a comprehensive analysis that takes us through needs identification um, and, and opportunity identification. And then ultimately, what can we afford based on revenue sources? And we've had a good discussion on that today. Uh, starts with goals and objectives, looks about needs to solve those goals and objectives, to accomplish those goals and objectives, and ultimately getting to a cost feasible plan. <clears throat> excuse me, um, that we're going to be asking for your recommendation for approval uh, later this year. As we look at that in a more simplified approach, you know, we, we've taken this topic by topic and we plan to continue doing that with our advisory committees and working group, but it started, you know, late last year with, you know, starting to get that data together, making sure that this could be a evidence-based data-informed planning process, objective and performance basis, as Laura mentioned. But focused on vision, what do we want to accomplish? What are our preferences? And that helps us guide and serves as a compass to our technical analyses. Um, and as we look at scenario planning to see, you know, what could happen and, and what if, you know, what are those implications, both the supply and demand, um, but also to societal factors and revenue sources. As part of this plan, as, and as we've discussed um, in, in previous um, meetings, you know, it's, we're also going to be doing a comprehensive health and environmental screening um, going well beyond what is required as part of the long range planning process. But, you know, this is us really putting our, our, our money where the mouth is um, and really following through on incorporating health, comprehensive health into the planning process. Not going to have too much time to talk about that today, but we are will be preparing here in the next few weeks um, a detailed presentation on our healthy mobility tool and how we're gonna be utilizing that in the planning process. So stay tuned on that. Um, you know, we talked about it you know, last month, uh, last week at our working group meeting, uh, but just given some time constraints and, and some agenda constraints, uh, we'll be preparing that a pre-recorded presentation and sending that out to you as soon as it's ready. Again, adopting in December later this year, um, a cost feasible plan as well as an unfunded needs plan. So the next part of my presentation, I'm just gonna kind of tackle topic by topic, let you know uh, what we've accomplished and where we're going. Like I said, we, we started this, uh, this process off with data development, making sure that we had sound comprehensive data so we could use that in a quantitative, in our quantitative analysis. We completed our trend land use forecast. So we looked at socioeconomic information and, and worked with uh, FDOT as well as our local government partners to develop a trend-based land use forecast, looking at you know, where we're seeing uh, intensities and concentrations of of residential, commercial, and industrial land uses. We've also partnered with FDOT and our local government agencies to complete what we call our existing committed network. So that looks at you know where we currently have, uh, what we currently have in place uh, as it relates to roadway capacity as well as other multimodal um, transportation infrastructure where we have gaps and that will help us as we get into needs assessment and filling and solving for those gaps. We also uh, identified our constrained network as part of that exercise to really understand where can we build if we do need to build um, 
and where can we not where we need to focus on on other solutions as laura mentioned as we look at strategies as part of our congestion management process where do we need to dig a little bit deeper um, into those non-capacity solutions to improve reliability improve safety also on our website is our existing conditions and origin and destination analysis website so this looks at where we're at now, how are we traveling? How have we traveled in the past? Um, and that'll help us you know, plan for the future with having that good understanding of where we've been and where we're at. Um, something I'm working on right now, and hopefully I'll be sending you links to some interactive maps. We recognize that a lot of our technical documentations is somewhat challenging to read, especially um, given the footprint that we have, our three county area, you know, like I said, in the past, it's larger than Delaware. Um, so it's hard to fit on an 11 by, uh, or rather an eight and a half by 11, um, you know, portrait page. So we're, we're developing some dynamic web maps where you can kind of zoom in and, and see all the information that we're sharing um, in our uh, technical documentation. So that'd be really helpful providing all of our partners as well as uh, our stakeholders with that information. So similar to our interactive TIP, you'll be able to zoom in and see all the different data sources and, and information that we provide in our technical documentation. Um, you know, our goals and objectives, we talked about this a, a few times, you know, these are our guiding principles, kind of the overarching compass that we use as we plan for needs, as we plan for congestion management, as Laura mentioned, um, and also as we look at prioritization in the coming months, these will be um, really the principles, the things that we're accomplish um, when we start uh, analyzing um, needs, but also in advancing projects. So it's no longer just about volume to capacity ratios and levels of congestion. It's about solving for these multi-faceted goals and objectives, um, which will definitely influence the outcomes of this plan. Laura mentioned the congestion management process, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on that other than reminding you that, you know, it, is, it has been our tradition to incorporate that as part of our metropolitan transportation plan. It is required by law. Um, and, you know, like I said, it, it helps us ingrain that performance-based approach, both for long-term planning, um, but also for short-term monitoring to make sure that our long-term vision, uh, that we're staying on track with our long-term vision year to year. Scenario planning has been a presentation that uh, we've talked about um, last month, actually, in detail. We took it to the board again. Um, you know, we, ha we have our four alternative futures, um, that, that traditional trend future, which is that historic um, trend looking pa past 20 years. How have we grown um, some, of, some of those pre-COVID-19 conditions? Um, we also took into consideration a lot of the feedback we received from our advisory committees, working group, and the board, and we actually developed a disruption dilemma scenario. So this actually looks at a lot of the issues that we're experiencing today, you know, higher levels of active transportation, lower transit ridership, uh, you know, higher um, preference to live in the suburbs, you know, just given that work from home, tele, teleworking uh, presence. We also have our technology transformation scenario, which looks at how our region will really embrace technology and what are those impacts societal and transportation. Uh, on things like autonomy, um, automated connected and electric vehicles. We've, we've talked about that at, at your past presentation. And our climate consequences, that's our high growth scenario. Uh, so even though it has that ominous title, it really is our high growth scenario, uh, really due in part to uh, population shifts of in-migration from the Caribbean as well as our Florida coastal areas coming more inland into central Florida and what that will mean to the economy, um, both on the transportation side as well as in the built environment. We're gonna be using scenario planning um, and really try to understand those key drivers of change, you know, as we look at, you know, transportation, society, economy, visitation, um, the built environment, land use. Um, and we're gonna look at that in our scenario and in, in our needs assessment process to really look at how um, needs and opportunities are unique and significant in each of our scenarios. So that will help us look into the future, polish our crystal ball um, to really better understand what the future would be like. Um, historically, traditionally, we've used that traditional trend type scenario as part of this planning process, as part of our long range planning process. Um, so this scenario planning exercise will allow us to take a much broader look, uh, much more far sighted look um, to help us, you know, uh, maintain feasibility at the same time. Uh, as I mentioned, multimodal needs assessment, another important element of the, the planning process. What are our needs and what are those opportunities? Uh, I presented last month the, the various approaches that we're using, um, unique to each mode of travel. So we have a, um, you know, a unique you know, transit analysis approach. We have a unique bicycle pedestrian analysis approach, identifying 
those low stress streets, identifying crosswalk opportunities, and identifying those critical sidewalk gaps. Um, you know, each of those approaches is really data informed, evidence based, um, in and in aligned with our goals and objectives that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. And I think something that's really important, you know, we really want this plan to be implemented. You know, it's not just a document for the shelf. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we can follow through with our short term planning products, prioritized project list and the transportation improvement program that you heard presentations on earlier. So as we're developing this plan, we're ensuring those funding policies and eligibility categories um, are maintained so we can really have a one to one implementation schedule from our long range plan into our shorter term planning documents so we can get those projects funded in the work program. Funding is another important element. You know, the long range plan shall be or must be cost feasible as part of federal and state law. Um, we do that by identifying uh, available funding sources. You know, what is statutorily available to the federal, state, and our local government partners. Uh, we did receive a federal and state uh, revenue forecast um, from FDOT. That's part of our MPOAC um, coordination. Um, those revenue forecasts do acknowledge and incorporate a declining gas tax and a partial electrification um, of the fleet. And all MPOs across the state of Florida use those same projections to help maintain funding consistency. So as DOT does their, um, what they call their revenue estimating conference, we use that information and incorporate that into our planning process. Uh, we, we also, um, you know, coordinate with our counties, you know, the transportation system is funded um, primarily with gas tax revenues, as, as we've talked about today, um, but local governments do have available um, other sources that can fund uh, transportation capital and operation expenditures. So we're working with our local government partners to produce those forecasts. We're producing an existing sources forecast, which is actually what we have to adopt um, for our cost feasible plan. But we're also going through that, trans, uh, that uh, funding visioning exercise. So what are those illustrative sources? What may be levied? What may be passed? Um, you know, by a supermajority or by referendum, um, so we can see it. You know, advancing our transportation. You know, a lot of that is sales tax oriented funding, um, but we are including that in the plan. But we have to acknowledge um, that we will be using existing sources as part of our cost feasible plan development. And as those ad additional sources, those illustrative sources come to fruition, we'll be amending. Um, our plan to, uh, to accommodate those sources. We're also ingraining the uh, MPO funding policies that we currently have, you know, as Nick and Keith mentioned in their presentations about, you know, our, our transportation uh, management area, our TMA, or we call our SU, those are our urban federal funds that the Metro Plan Orlando Board has control over. We incorporate that into our planning process here to make sure, again, an implementation focus. We're also looking at kind of that DDR, that district dedicated revenue uh, policy that our board has 30% of that money can be used for premium transit as well as, as really a seed funding mechanism. So if local governments um, identify funding opportunities um, for their premium transit, we'll be able to provide that match seed funding to get those projects live sooner than later. So, you know, that, that's kind of where we've been. Um, but now I want to talk about where we're going. You know, like I said, we are in the identification of needs and opportunities process right now. Um, we'll be wrapping that up really in the next four to six weeks. Um, and like I said, that uses that, that multimodal objective driven process. Um, after we get through that, we'll be doing a, a healthy community and environmental mitigation screening on all of those needs to make sure that, you know, we're identifying some of those fatal flaw or, or kind of red flag issues so we can start mitigating them, controlling them and, and seeing how we can actually solve for them. So it's not just about mitigating the environment, but restoring and improving it along the way. Throughout this process, you know, we're going to continue to coordinate with our local government partners as well as some state agencies, especially as we get into the environment and environment mitigation process. We you know we'll be coordinating uh, with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, uh, which will help us, you know, have that environmentally sound, um, which aligns with our goals and objectives. But also at the end of the day, you know, as I've said many times, this has to be a cost feasible plan. And we'll be bringing that back to you later this year. So we'll take our needs prioritize those needs based on, based on preference and accomplishing our goals and objectives. And then we'll be overlaying available existing revenue sources to identify a cost feasible transportation plan. Of course, we update this plan every five years. You know, so we, we're always revisiting issues, policies, trends, the future. And we, and we do acknowledge as we look out, you know, um, 
2035 and beyond that there are some uncertainties. Um, you know, things are changing. The forecast and projections of, um, of, of various issues are always, always changing and improving. And that's why this planning process is that continuing and comprehensive process that we, that we go through in a collaborative nature. So with that, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Questions, um, Mr. O'Hanlon, you recognize. Yes, Alex, we have certainly discussed this before. I, I love your plan and the reality of it is it really validates the reason why those last two performance measures that I mentioned, we really need to do. We need to keep track of passenger trips by autonomous vehicles and not only emissions reductions, but the number of miles by electric vehicles, because even though those numbers are close to zero today, people by charting these, you're not gonna see that as fact that it's an arithmetic progression. Not, it's not a geometric, geometric progression. It's gonna be exponential. And the second it goes exponential and you have the data to prove it, then we can make some much better decisions about what the future is really gonna look like. Because the last hundred years is gonna tell us nothing about what's just gonna happen in the next 10 years. And that will be, give you the data that we can make some intelligent decisions. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And we are using a variety of forecasts, you know, especially as it relates to autonomous connected and, and vehicle electrification, a lot of different think tanks, you know, a, a lot of research has gone into the assumptions that we're making for our scenario planning process. You know, as I've acknowledged to you and, and to, to all of our committees, they may not be as aggressive as as, as desired, um, but they are, you know, kind of that mean average that, of, uh, of all of the various forecasts that from, you know, across the board, from Federal Highway, from FDOT, from dozens of academic and, and private industry think tanks um, to really look at, you know, what will be the impact, what will be the demand, what will be the implications um, acknowledging that it's not just a function of cost, um, but a function of materials, supply, um, and, and, and other societal issues like, you know, vehicle ownership, um, the financial industry, the insurance industry, and, and how that guides and, and dictates um, our spending habits and purchasing patterns. So I, I hear you, I'm with you, um, but I always do have to acknowledge, you know, the, the, the moderate approach that we are taking to our are forecasting of autonomous connected and electric vehicles. Thank you. Ms. Webster, you're recognized. Uh, yes, I wanna bring <laughs> again, our current circumstances into perspective. Um, and I'm very interested in continuing to pursue transit in a meaningful way, even though I know currently ridership is down, there are health concerns, but I think um, this plan allows for us to continue to use, uh, to build our, our transit sector because we're, in my opinion, we're behind the eight ball. We're, we're not up to snuff when it comes to our transit and how we're working with transit. So, I know that's not specifically a question, but I would encourage you to continue to see how we can improve transit. I know a lot of that's dependent on funding. Um, and there are a lot of questions right now, but I wouldn't want to see us overlook transit because of the exist the current uh, issues with it. Yeah, absolutely. And we're certainly not overlooking transit. And I think that's the acknowledgement of the scenario planning process in that broad spectrum of alternative futures that we're looking at. Of course, we do have that disruption dilemma scenario, which has a you know much more um, conservative or slower rate of, of transit growth. Um, but our other scenarios, the technology transformation and climate consequences have a much more um, or a higher trend of, of transit ridership that's just based on on population and technology um, but yeah you're absolutely right funding does drive um, and, and dictate in most cases implementation um, the federal and state government only have so much money 
um, to really jumpstart the, the transit service. It really does fall to local governments and, and local funding sources um, to see those through. You know, and as I acknowledge, you know, as part of our needs assessment, we are identifying kind of a regional transit vision, a regional transit plan that is not funding constrained. Um, so we'll have that, you know, and that's our that's our vision. And a lot of that work has been done, you know, in coordination with links as well as our local government partners. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what we'll be adopting in December will be a, a, a transit plan, a transportation plan that is based on existing sources. So that may look a little more bleak um, than our vision, um, but that's the reality and, and that is a federal requirement. Um, but I think that gives us a lens to look through and understanding what we want to accomplish and what we need to do locally and regionally to see that vision come to fruition. Excellent point, Ms. Webster. Ms. Mott, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great presentation, Mr. Traeger. That was great. I had one question pertaining to one of the previous slides you presented, the one um, scenario planning. You had, it, it lists four different alternatives for the future, and one of them was the disruption dilemma. Can you expand on the factors for that and some of the measurements for that, please? Yeah, sure. So that was that came up actually as part of this discussion that we had with our you know with the community advisory committee with our working group um, you know as well as just discussion in you know with our municipal advisory committee um, specifically uh, I'm, I'm I'm pulling up some notes so I can kind of give you the facts on that but it really looks at a a future where we're having you know these types of disruptions so kind of a world where pandemics and other emergencies really disrupt Central Florida's, you know, population, visitor, and economic growth, um, which has absolute impact or effect on, on travel behavior, uh, on development patterns long term. So this is one of those, you know, we acknowledge that after, after emergencies, after these uh, pandemics or other disruptions that we typically rebound. Um, you know, it takes some time, a few years to rebound, but, you know, we, there's a, we have a record of, of rebounding. Um, but this particular scenario basically is a, per, uh, it perpetuates that disruption. So we're going to be looking at a, a higher rate of people working remotely, you know, as we're experiencing right now, uh, we'll be looking at lower density development patterns. So, you know, and that's kind of seen in, you know, I was, you know, my father's a realtor and, you know, I was looking at, you know, uh, suburban, you know, sales, you know, there's a, you know, a huge push for people, you know, a desire to actually wanting to live back in the suburbs. Um, we're going to see permanent shifts in supply chains. So in the freight and goods movement um, to accommodate more home delivery and also potentially bringing some of that manufacturing back to the United States and what that means to Florida, what that means to central Florida and the counties surrounding us, the more rural counties like Polk Lake, Sumter, Marion, who are are really our manufacturing hubs in, in kind of the central Florida area, aside from Jacksonville and South Florida. We're looking at an increased active transportation. You know, we're seeing a lot of that, a lot of yeah. bike sales, you know, a lot of people riding those trails, trying to get out of the house, exert some energy, is kind of, you know, get some of those feel good hormones. Um, and, you know, you know, as, as Theo mentioned, you know, there's some anxiety over, over public transportation, aviation, um, as well as shared mobility and other modes. Um, which will increase our reliance on single occupancy vehicles. So as we look at you know, the specifics, the parameters, that's kind of conceptually what we're looking at, um, but we're looking at decreased population growth. So uh, lower than average population growth, slower visitation, especially international visitors. Um, the technology factor is pretty much the same. We're looking at about 70% of the fleet being automated by 2045, but with a greater emphasis or uh, a greater focus on personal ownership versus that shared fleet ownership, just given some of those. Was that 75%? Did you say 70? 70? 70. 70%, okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, and as it relates to land use, like I said, a greater focus on low density or redevelopment, kind of, you know, kind of going back to the suburbs. And as it relates to climate, that other key driver, that's gonna run pretty consistent, you know, where we'll have graduate, Gra gradual increases in temperature, um, but more frequent extreme weather events and, excuse me, moderate sea level rise. Okay. But I think I encapsulated it earlier on, you know, aside from the parameters, I think it's more about that narrative of, of 
of looking at the issues that we have today that we've been experiencing over the past 10 to 14 weeks and seeing that continue to seeing that perpetuate um, 20 plus years. It's one of many scenarios. I have to acknowledge that. And as we go into our needs assessment process, we're looking at the needs, the issues, the opportunities of each of those. So we're not going to be uh, adopting a scenario, one of the scenarios. We're considering all of them so we can plan, uh, I say plan better for the future, considering what may or may not occur rather than just looking to the past for solutions for the future. Well, great. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, just a comment. We need to not allow Mr. O'Hanlon to use the word exponentially because we know we're in trouble when he says that. <laughs> I mean, it's going to go on and on, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Tom, Thank you, you can't say it. Stop saying exponentially because then you scare us. You scare me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alex. Alex, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, and for our final presentation, and I think we're okay on time. Um, Mr. Mike Wilson is going to give us a presentation on bike lane research. Mike, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the promised uh, follow-up presentation from, uh, from a couple months back. Now that we've got some uh, exposure data, we can really dive into what's really happening with, uh, with bikeways on our roads. Uh, we can answer some important questions such as do bikeways or sidewalks really protect bicyclists from motorist caused crashes? Uh, what are the really important factors that contribute to crashes? And there's also that safety in numbers presumption that's been out there for quite some time that the presumption is that it's due to improved motorist behavior as the number of bicyclists increases. And we can actually address that question as well. Uh, what we looked at was 10 uh, streets that had bike lanes for 10 years or more and then we found 10 control streets that were comparable in their characteristics, you know, number of lanes, amount of traffic, et cetera. And then we had 10 years of crash data uh, for, for all of those roads. Of course, they're all classified in the way that you saw in, in my last presentation. Then we also did 48-hour uh, bike counts. And so we counted the, the bike lane street and the control street at the same, same time. And another interesting thing we did is we looked at the speeds of bicyclists. How fast were they going if they were in a travel lane or a bike lane or on a sidewalk? And that has some important bearing as well. Usually when you hear about bikeway studies, there are one of two approaches. One is they'll look at a street, at streets with and without bikeways, uh, as I have, or they'll compare a street before and after a bikeway. But then they'll just grossly do count the number of bicyclists, count the number of crashes, and get a crash rate without really looking into the details of them. And they're often missing many uh, confounding factors. Uh, a, a highly touted study from Montreal looking at cycle tracks in 2011, this is one example of a pair of streets. Uh, they think they did about six pairs where the bikeway street was actually a one lane, one way residential street. And their control street was a two way, four lane commercial street. Which do you think would have more of a crash problem even with or without a bikeway? Uh, so the other things we want to, so the key thing we want to look, look at is, you know, are we really changing motorist behavior when we install a, a bikeway, if we're, if the, if the goal of a bikeway is to protect bicyclists. So what, what you're going to be seeing here today is that we're, we've compared the streets with and without bikeways, we're counting the bicyclists by position and direction, and we're counting the, the crashes by the behavior type, so that we can actually look at crash rates by the crash type. Uh, we have to have kind of a, a baseline for what we're comparing with. So ultimately, we start off with uh, assuming that uh, the default position for a bicyclist is traveling on the road with the flow of traffic. Well, that only accounted for 2% of the motorist cause, 2% of, of the overall crashes were motorist cause crashes involving cyclists in travel lanes. Another 10% of the crashes overall were uh, motorist cause with the bicyclist in a bike lane. And of course, the remainder were either sidewalk riders or cyclists who had caused the crash. So to look at that graphically, uh, what we're talking about primarily are the overtaking crashes, 
the drive outs, uh, the right hooks, and the left crosses. And the way we came up with our exposure uh, uh, estimate on this is we took our 48 hour bicyclist count, we multiplied it by the length of the street segment, and then there's a multiplier of 1825, which gets us from 48 hours to 10 years. So we've got the equal uh, crash period and risk period. And how that gets expressed is by bicyclist miles between crashes. And in this case, a higher number means lower risk. So uh, the first chart here, just showing it uh, very basically bicyclists going with the flow and just motorists cause crashes. And here we see travel lane actually has the highest crash risk and then about half lower for, for bike lane users and then four times lower for, for sidewalk riders. But you'll see that there's a number of buts that go into this uh, as we get into the data a little more deeply. Um, one of which is, okay, that was just looking at traffic going with the flow of traffic. When we look at cyclists going against the flow, here we see that it's over five times greater risk for cyclists on the sidewalk going against the flow of traffic. I think as I explained last time, going against the flow on the sidewalk is legal, going against the flow on the roadway is not. Um, this is just to, to show the, uh, the difference graphically. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, I guess the, uh, my slides got, got a little jumbled here. I'll get back to the uh, issue of cyclists going against the flow on the roadway a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, so moving on to the other crashes involving cyclists going with the flow, uh, for overtaking crashes, the uh, crash rate is uh, about 89,000, or you can see about six times, six and a half times lower for the bike lane uh, travelers than for the um, travel lane users, which is something that we would expect that, that a bike lane should do a good job at minimizing that risk for overtaking crashes. But you have to put that into context and re remember that only um, you know, that bike lane, that overtaking crashes are relatively rare compared to crashes overall. In this particular study of 10 of 20 streets, there were only uh, 10 overtaking crashes and only one of those involved an incapacitating injury. While there were over 400 other motorist caused crashes involving turning and crossing movements that had 60 incapacitating injuries and one fatality. So when we look at these turning and crossing conflicts, uh, here again, we'll see that uh, the travel lane users uh, had the highest risk with the bike lane a little bit lower and sidewalk a little bit lower still. But then that raises an interesting question. So why would that risk be lower for the turning and crossing conflicts for the bike lanes um, and, and especially for the, for the sidewalk users? So a common assumption is that when we designate a bike lane that motorists will be more cautious because of that, that designation, they'll be more likely to yield to, to a cyclist. But that doesn't explain why the sidewalk risk is even lower still because sidewalks are neither designated for nor designed for bicyclists. But there's another thing that we can look at and that is the speed of the users of, of the bicyclists. The 85th percentile speed for the average sidewalk rider is about 12 and a half miles an hour and that rider needs about 60 feet of stopping distance. The bike lane user, as you can see, getting closer to 16 miles an hour needing over 80 feet. And then the travel lane user at 18 and a half miles per hour uh, and needing over 100 feet of stopping distance. So think of the ramifications of that when a motorist has violated the right of way of the cyclist, that the sidewalk rider is going to be much more able to avoid that crash, avoid that conflict. And here you can see it represented graphically as the speed of the cyclist goes up, so does their risk. Uh, and then again, so here is that, that slide regarding uh, wrong way on the roadway. Um, something didn't get saved correctly. So anyway, uh, uh, I mean, I had made some updates. I, that actually, that, that number for 4,600 um, is not correct. Uh, I'll have to make sure we get the, uh, these, these numbers corrected, but uh, the travel lane difference is also about five and a half times uh, while the bike lane is, as you see there, about 
about uh, four and a half times. So while the bike lane is um, somewhat lower risk for, for facing traffic crashes, because there are so many more bike lane users, there were many more uh, facing traffic crashes. There were 38 of those for bike lane users compared to six for the travel lanes. We also looked at shared use paths there were, that are adjacent to roadways, the side, side paths. And I was interested in seeing how do they compare with regular sidewalks. And when we looked at the uh, crash data there, we see that they do have a better crash rate. You can see 67,000 miles between crashes for the side path users compared to 40,000 for sidewalks. And the speeds of those path users was somewhat higher along the same lines as, uh, as a bike lane user. And here you can see how they compare the orange bars being the side paths and the blue ones, the, uh, the regular sidewalks. But not all side paths are created equal. So when we looked into these paths in more detail, we found that three of them had very few conflict points along, along their lengths. Uh, three of them had on average four and a half uh, intersections and commercial driveways per mile, while the other two had 11 and a half commercial driveways and intersections per mile. And so you can see there's a much lower crash risk for those low conflict paths uh, than for the high conflict one. And then you see in the third row there, the, the, the regular sidewalks, a little bit fewer in the way of uh, conflicts, um, but really a significantly um, higher risk for those high conflict paths, a third higher risk. And that corresponds to actually a third higher bicyclist travel speed. So moving on to safety in numbers, does this really improve motorist behavior? So what we have in this chart is in the, the blue bars are the bicyclist exposure. We've taken the 20 roads, divided them up into quintiles and five groups and looked at the total bicyclist exposure. We can really kind of throw out this bottom quintile, both the numbers of exposure and the number of crashes is so tiny um, as to be not relevant. Uh, but when we look at the difference between the second quintile and the top quintile, there's nine times as much bicyclist traffic. Um, but look at the orange line. This is the miles between motorist cause crashes. And that's relatively flat. While the, the green line, which is miles between bicyclist cause crashes, uh, goes up, which means gets safer. So it's the bicyclist cause crashes that are greatly reduced about 2.7 times with essentially no real difference in the motorist cause crash rate. So to kind of put it into a broader context, just looking at the statistics more, more globally, the bike lane streets compared to the travel lane streets had 28% more overall bicycle travel, but they also had an 11% higher motorist cause crash rate. That's really driven more by the sidewalk users than by the bike lane and the, and the travel lane users. Uh, there were, as a, as a sheer number, there were 34, 34% more motorist cause crashes. And there were also six times as many wrong way cyclist crashes. And again, that's wrong way on the roadway, not on the sidewalk. So to wrap things up with some key findings, uh, so going against the flow, presents at least four times greater risk than going with the flow, regardless of the bicyclist position. Uh, each additional intersection and commercial driveway uh, is basically increasing the crash risk by about one and a half percent. The bicyclist speed, each additional mile per hour, is increasing risk by about nine percent. And as I said, the safety in numbers is really due to safer bicyclist behavior. So that concludes my presentation. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, well, excellent presentations. I don't see any hands up at this point. Um, so Mike, thank you very, very much. Excellent job. Thank you. I'll conclude our presentations for today. Um, and moving on, I think we're okay on time now. Uh, just general information, there are several items on the general information tab four in your agenda packets. 
uh, upcoming meetings. Our next CAC meeting will be August 26th. And as we hear, heard earlier, it may be an in-person meeting or not. We're not sure for right now. So there will be updates from Metro Plan Orlando with regard to that. The next Metro Plan Orlando board meeting will be June 29th. And this is actually done early so that we can kind of know how things are gonna fall with regard for things in July and being able to meet. Uh, at this point, are there any comments from uh, committee members? Use your raised hand. We have Mr. O'Hanlon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Teresa, what you need to look at is hopefully in the middle of September, Elon Musk will have his battery day. And if he says that he can make the batteries for $100 a kilowatt, that's equivalent to what it costs to make a gas car. If he says he's got the technology already to make batteries at under $100 a kilowatt, yes. that means starting next year, cars will be cheaper if they're electric than gas. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Okay, our next section is public comments. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use the raise hand function and you will be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad. We'll unmute your mic after which you will be recognized. Please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to two minutes, please. Mary Ann, do we have any comments? Um, we do not appear to have any hands up from the public, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Are there any written or phone comments that were submitted before the meeting? We did not receive any general comments beforehand, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Well, that takes us to the end of our agenda. I'd like to take a, just a moment and say thank you to all the committee members for being patient and working through this process. I also thank you to all of the staff at Metro Plan for the presentations that were done. They were all done excellent. And uh, also preparing for this meeting today and uh, getting me prepped to do this. And thank you to our chair, Ms. Sarah, Sarah Abadri, for entrusting me to take the helm for this meeting. With that, I'll say the meeting is adjourned. Great job, thank Mr. You. Campbell. Thank you. Good job, Jeffrey. Thank you. <laughs>